2019. Um, we're really glad that all of you were able to join us today. Um, my name is Pam Jensen, and I am the statewide project coordinator for the Transition Improvement Grant, or many of you know us as TIG. And presenting with me today, Alicia Reinhardt, who is our DPI representative for transition. Kathy Tuttle, who's the Northern Regional Transition Coordinator. Brian Kenny, the Southern Regional Coordinator. And then we have several of our TIG staff joining us behind the scenes today that are managing our chats, um, making sure the webinar goes smoothly and all those great things. So thank you to all of them. We're in really changing times right now, as we all know, as we're dealing with our schools closing. Virtual learning is new to some of us. Um, social distancing and then just all the other impacts that we have around COVID-19. This webinar for us is a time to be together, to learn together, and to take away some, um, some of the challenging times we're facing and also just to take a deep breath. We have a lot of people with us today. We have over 200 people that have registered. So if you start having issues with bandwidth, maybe turning off your camera might be helpful or logging off, logging back on um, are some of the few things that have helped on the bigger webinars we've been on. Um, but we will be recording this event today, this webinar. So if you happen to get kicked off or aren't able to stay on the webinar, we will have a recording for it um, within a couple of days. On our TIG website, we also have a featured information section. If you scroll down on our website, that has our Padlet we'll be using today and also the PowerPoint posted there, as well as some other resources and websites that might be helpful during this time. All right, and in today's agenda, we're going to be looking at um, sharing some resources, family considerations, um, organized learning, and how to collaborate with transition partners as we review the transition resources and consider things online. As we know, the state of Wisconsin school districts have closed in an effort to slow the spread of the coronavirus. So this webinar is meant to really support you as educators and agencies in this time and how we can work together um, to make transition still happen. So we're going to take a quick poll, again, looking at the roles of people so that all of you can see who's on the webinar today as well. So Lisa, if you can post our first question. Pam, one moment, please. Sure. Telling me I'm logged in from another device. We had this all working great just 20 minutes ago, <laughs> so hold tight with us. As I'm sure you're all experiencing some of this kind of fun stuff as well. And while we're waiting um, to get going, can you remind the group where they can find the PowerPoint and resources? Absolutely, so if you go onto the TIG website and you scroll down, there's a featured information section on our website and that will have um, six boxes, all to do with, with COVID-19. And I believe it's the first box that you can find the PowerPoint in, first or second. And we can pass our polls for right now too and move on so that we're, we can keep on time and answer any questions that you guys have too. So now I'm going to turn it over to Alicia who's gonna talk a little bit about the DPI page and information as well as frequently asked questions. 
Thanks, Pam. Um, I'm excited to be here with you all, even if it's virtually through a computer screen. Um, I did just want to spend a few minutes referencing uh, a few of the resources that DPI has um, available to anyone um, out on the web. The first link on the slide here is the COVID-19 web page. You will find that when you go to um, dpi.gov. Um, wi.gov right at the top of the home page that there's a link to the COVID page. If you click that, that page has a wealth of information um, that is updated almost to the hour um, from the different teams at DPI. It includes um, as well um, some links to our partners from DHS. <clears throat> and DVR. Um, there's resources there um, for any learner as well as archived messages from our administration, our state superintendent Carolyn Sanford Taylor um, and deputy um, superintendent Mike Thompson have been regularly communicating um, with district administrators and but I find those communications to be really helpful for me and other educators in the field as well. So I often reference that communication. If you scroll down on that COVID page, you'll find a, a list of gray drop down menus and one of them um, is labeled special education. Um, if you click that drop down menu, there will be a link to a specific um, special education web page. The special education team now has their own COVID web page that will be our main resource online for where we post any new information. Um, in terms of supporting our students with IEPs during this public health emergency. Um, a couple of things I wanted to highlight on that page. Um, <clears throat> There is a frequently asked question document that's going to be updated weekly from um, the special education team. It was updated yesterday. Um, it will most likely be updated on Thursday unless there's any pertinent information to push out sooner. Um, I know many of us are um, regularly used to communication from the special education team on Thursday afternoons. So that uh, structure and schedule will continue. Um, in addition, we have more guidance from the federal government and um, guidelines they've put out around implementing special education during this unprecedented time, um, as well as some other information for specifically probably special education administrators around school finance questions um, and links to other pertinent um, teams resources um, to supporting students with uh, IEPs. One thing I did want to highlight in the FAQ that was released yesterday afternoon um, is that a few questions were added regarding how we handle graduation for students with IEPs during this school closure, um, which I think is pretty pertinent to, to our audience today. So I encourage you all to um, go read those few questions. They start with question number 21. Um, all of the questions are dated. So any questions that were added yesterday are dated for uh, April, 12, April 2nd, excuse me, for two. Um, specifically, what I wanted to note from those questions on how to support graduation for our students with IEPs is that the same procedures um, that are in place when we're in school continue to be in place. So that includes that the notice of graduation, um, either the P3 or the P4, need to be completed, um, and that is completed with an IEP team meeting, as well as the summary of performance also needs to be provided. Um, to the, to the student and the IEP team. Now, some of those notice of graduation meetings may have already happened, and that's okay. Um, IEP teams should just consider uh, any updates that they might need to make to any of those documents based on some changes that have happened so far this year. Um, other things I'd highlight from the new questions around graduation is that um, just a reminder that IEP teams make the decision whether or not a student has met the graduation requirements and their IEP goals that procedure and protocol stays in place and that school boards may make um, changes to graduation requirements in the coming week, but those are local decisions. And if that were to happen, that same procedure where the IEP team needs to make the decision around meeting graduation requirements on an individual basis, that needs to stay in place. Um, and right now we don't have any guidance on how ESY um, 
may be impacted for students who are transitioning from school. I know um, I've received a question from the field yesterday that's a, a regular practice sometimes in transition. Um, I have shared that question with our compliance team and they will consider that as we continue to receive information um, from the Department of Ed um, and, and our legal team at DPI. So we will definitely share that with you all as we get updates. But right now, there is no specific guidance on that. The same extended school year procedures would apply as during um, a normal school year and when school is in session. I'm sure much of what I just talked about probably raised some questions. <clears throat> so if you do have questions, keep recording them in the chat. We have um, wonderful TIG staff keeping track of that and we will pause for questions about halfway through the presentation, but I'm gonna turn it back over to Pam and she's gonna share some more information with you. So actually we're gonna turn it over to Kathy Tuttle to talk about um, family considerations. Hello, all. Uh, I saw a lot of familiar fa uh, names uh, come up as you uh, chimed in. It's a lot of familiar faces, so hello. In this time of isolation, it is so wonderful to see um, familiar faces, even if it is on a screen. Um, you know, during these very, very unprecedented, these unprecedented times, um, educators and families are in uncharted territory. And to, as educators, um, we will continue to be mindful and also to be mindful that without school, our families may have some changing roles. Um, they may now be becoming teachers in their homes, counselors and coaches and friends for their child. So this is a very stressful time for families as they adapt and transition to these new roles and being in a different way in a different part of their um, child's education. And we are ready. I know you all are ready to support them. And we also want to just take a moment to know that we need to honor families and, and um, to allow families to be families and to honor that and their routines. Make connections, talk to families and see what the families and students need and then work together to make it happen. I heard this at a meeting the other day from um, one of the DPI staff and she said, from now on, the I in individualized will be even bigger in our work ahead. And also in the case um, uh, CEC, which um, Children with Exceptional, um, Exceptional Children, um, in their webinar, um, they said, focus on connecting and coherence and think about the big picture. So we wanted to just kind of have that piece of information to start this off as we talk about families a little bit. Okay, Pam, I think you need to ex um, go to the next slide. Um, we can support families to see opportunities for this is a building skills that maybe building skills now that are not all paper pencil. Um, we can support and encourage and assist families to have their student involved in practicing life skills and developing that desire to work or offering enriching experiences. All the while they may be keeping in mind their children's goals. They can take these opportunities to build self-advocacy and self-determination through the use of real situations that are happening, such as, um, you know, taking care of business and taking care of chores and having their child to make their own choices. As we support families, we can see that all the things that we are working for in education, they can be taught in these more um, real situations that they, um, we are in 24-7. We will be supporting families in providing routines, in fostering choice that they are making throughout the day. So many activities can be building independence and self-determination and self-advocacy skills. And they are also building during that time transferable skills to um, work experiences they may have or they may be interested in. All of these engaging activities are ways to support learning. There are some examples on the screen Everything from preparing meals and snacks to organ having, having your child organize their work, exploring hobbies such as maybe going fishing, um, being able to listen and read to books uh, you know, that they haven't had an opportunity to or having families, um, that reading time at night. Um, so these are all ways that you can capture and support learning that are outside of the box 
and engaging for your for their children. There are also we have found some really nice um, family um, support websites. Um, one is the Child Mind Institute, and it has a daily Facebook video chats with clinicians, remote evaluations, telemedicine, comprehensive resources, and on-air experts for media. There's also the Parent Caregiver Guide to Helping Families Cope with COVID. This will provide information on what you should know about readiness, response strategies, how to help your child cope, and seeking with additional help. There's also uh, talking to children about COVID-19, a parent resource, and it is from the National Association of School Psychologists with specific guidelines and taking time to work with your child along with lots of, of individual resources. Of course, the Wisconsin DPI site also has information for families in these topic areas, and it is under resources for families and schools. Um, the, there's a tab, especially for families and schools. So we wanted to put this as a framework as we start talking about um, some resources for you as you go into these uncharted ter territories, um, because we will all be in this together, including our families. We're gonna take a minute to answer a few questions now. So Jen, if you wanna unmute yourself and share some of the questions that have come up in the chat. Sure thing. There was a question when Alicia was sharing information from the department asking about students who are about to exit due to aging out and how they can be supported with employment agencies. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, before I get started, I'm definitely going to reference that. I just want everyone to know that we are going to do our absolute best to answer your questions today, but there are a lot of things that remain unanswered, even for us at the department. And so what we're hopeful it, about is that today is going to provide us an opportunity to collect those questions that you have, take them back to our resources if we can't answer them, um, and hopefully share more information as the days go on with you all. Um, I will also want to highlight that we're going to have two networking sessions that may be great times um, to answer some of those questions by just hearing what your peers are doing to support students around Wisconsin. <clears throat> So the first um, question that Jen just referenced was around supporting students who are reaching that maximum age and transitioning to adult long-term care. Um, right now, we don't have any formal guidance around that. Like I said, I imagine we're going to get more formal guidance from the state. So I would encourage as, as best as possible to continue the collaboration with those agencies. Um, we're gonna highlight some collaboration strategies that some of our adult long-term care partners are utilizing um, in a few minutes. Uh, so unfortunately, the best answer I can provide is um, as best as possible um, to continue that collaboration with those agencies through virtual channels. Thank you. Um, the next question was more of an ask when resources are being shared, can the presenters please click on the links so that the participants could view the links opened? Sure, we could probably do that. I think maybe we'll um, keep going with our presentation and um, we can maybe go back to some of the main resources to highlight them. I think you'll all be really excited to see in a few minutes, um, Brian is going to share a Padlet that includes all of the resources we have linked in here. It will be a, a really nice way for you all to access those resources and kind of explore. In addition, um, like I said, we have great TIG staff monitoring the chat and we're going to compile anything that's um, asked or shared in the chat for another resource um, to be posted on the featured information section of our homepage. Thank you. And then the final statement, these weren't questions, but we're just getting some really nice sharing between educators at this time. Awesome. That was our purpose for being together today because we, we know that when we bring you all together that that just happens so naturally. So, all right. I think we will keep moving. Okay, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just want to say that I'm super excited to be able to connect with everyone um, virtually. 
Um, I desperately uh, miss my face-to-face -face connections, and I consider all of um, you educators as, as family. Um, these next two slides are going to be really focused on organizing your learning time. And as someone who's um, married to an educator myself, my wife is a 20-year um, elementary teacher veteran, and I have two children. Um, we're, we're right in the thick of trying to organize our learning time. So uh, probably the biggest thing is that we are all um, teachers, students, and families on a steep learning curve as we enter the world of virtual learning. Um, on the left is a graphic from CEC iLuma, uh, which was a webinar. Um, it shows the structure for organizing your time, uh, for preparing and providing learning time uh, for your students. On the right of the screen uh, are more detailed ideas for establishing a remote learning environment and a routine. The link under remote learning um, provides further guidance um, to each of the bulleted areas. So there's three bulleted areas there. Um, as you can see, for example, preparing your mind and your body for the day, uh, creating your workstation, um, and scheduling your day to include um, brain breaks. I know one of the first things that we do in the morning um, with our kids is we send them out for a 30 minute walk um, and they get to talk together and collaborate and um, build camaraderie. So I think that's really, really relevant and important for us. Um, setting your alarm um, for the same time each day, getting ready for the day, um, exercise or start your day with mindfulness type activities. If you're feeling really stir crazy, get into a routine um, that will minimize distractions. Creating a consistent workstation. Um, so some tips there are making sure you have a clean, clear space, uh, clear of any clutter and distractions. And it's consistently the same place where you go to do your work each and every day. Scheduling your day consistently um, allows for having a consistent schedule, including your, your time frames and any deadlines or due dates. Uh, there is also a link for brain breaks that include um, exercise opportunities. And you can see that link at the bottom of the screen. And you'll get all these resources um, like Alicia and Pam had referenced. Um, we built a really nice resource directory, so you'll see everything there. Um, and make sure you have time for reflection activities, as well as um, cultural activities and any volunteer opportunities. And utmost important, um, just practice self-care. Okay, Bam, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, this is the second slide on organizing learning time. And you'll see two graphics um, on the screen, choice boards and um, week at a glance. This is more of a like visual schedules. In the NTACT webinar on transition online learning and at home, um, they shared these examples for organizing your learning, which include lots of information on transition. Uh, the NTACT PowerPoint and COVID-19 um, resource page have the links for the choice board, as well as the week um, at a glance, um, both in word form, uh, so you can make them your own, uh, so you can actually edit them. And they are also linked um, on this page. So these are live links, both of these graphics. Stay connected with families. Uh, meet the students and the families where they are at. And these tools can be useful in providing um, continuity for student learning. Um, Kathy referenced some two really good quotes and I'm going to reference a really good one that I think is really applicable um, to these two slides is um, our, our current state of leadership as educators needs to be more contagious than the current COVID-19 virus and that's going to be really really important for us to continue to stay together and be together. Um, stay organized and efficient um, while you continue uh, to learn at home and embrace um, all the different opportunities for virtual learning. And we are really here to support you um, and the success of all families.
Pam, you're muted again. <clears throat> Transition partnership collaborations with DVR. Currently, all the DVR counselors are also working remotely. Um, so none of the DVR offices or the Wisconsin job centers are open to the public at this time. Um, DVR is still encouraging us though to continue to reach out to the DVR counselors either by phone, email, or text. And then to contact DVR service providers directly for information about any of the services that, um, that providers are providing to your students. If students are interested or families and students are talking about DVR services and they want to apply for services, they still can do that online and we'd encourage them to do that. And they also have um, several videos that DVR has completed or, or conducted and they are in our Padlet that we'll be sharing later or there's a link to the first video that they created, the 101 video. Um, that they created that parents and, and students could watch as well. Or um, if you're not as familiar with DVR as you'd like to be, they're also great resources for you as well. Um, DVR counselors right now are trying to attend IEP meetings on Zoom um, or any other Google Hangout or anything else that school districts are utilizing. Um, they're calling, texting, and emailing students to keep that communication open. They're offering um, skills to pay the bills sessions online, as well as doing some virtual job shadows and informational interviews by phone and by video. Um, and just trying to also be pretty creative with the things that they're doing. They're attempting to do some remote vocational evaluations and um, job search activities, resume development, interviewing skills. Um, applying for jobs. So they're, they're continuing to work with students on an individualized basis, um, doing everything remotely as well. There it goes. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, Alicia, did you want to take this slide? Yeah, perfect. <clears throat> So we wanted to spend a minute referencing um, a resp uh, some responses that our transition partners at DHS have created um, in in response to the pandemic. So I, I reached out, um, I was contacted by one of my colleagues at DHS a couple of weeks ago to let me know that um, response groups have been formed based on the family care and iris um, service maps. They've created four quadrant groups and essentially these groups are um, created to identify and respond directly to direct care um, emergencies around the state. So because of the pandemic, um, many individuals with direct care needs during the day are facing caregiver shortages because of facility closures, um, <clears throat> staff illness, um, unable to go to work and school. And so we shared this information on these response groups in the division newsletter la um, last week, Thursday, um, as well as it's gone out to some of our listservs for our school counselors and school social workers. Um, and essentially they were seeking individuals to meet on a regional basis to just brainstorm and identify those needs and see if they can't get them fulfilled. Um, in terms of our field, they were looking for educators or peer professionals professionals who may be displaced workers who could help support um, fulfilling some of those emergency direct care needs. So I encourage um, if you know of direct care needs um, or are interested in learning more, um, <clears throat> please reference um, the, the archived message. Um, on the special education um, webpage from the newsletter. There is contacts for each of the quadrant groups listed um, on, on that communication. And I would encourage uh, administrators or staff who could help coordinate more community-based responses and identify needs to participate in those groups. But if you're also um, an individual who feels like you could provide some direct care because you may be a displaced worker, you could certainly reach out to the DHS contacts on there as well. <clears throat> yeah. 
And as a group, as the transition coordinators have been working with school districts and talking with individuals, um, we understand that there's a need to connect with one another and kind of find out what each other is doing. So we've created a Google community um, that you can join to share those ideas, concerns, and thoughts that we'll monitor on a regular basis. And then we also have two upcoming networking meetings. Um, on April 9th at one o'clock and April 15th at nine o'clock. And those meetings will pose the same information, but we wanted to give a couple different opportunities in case you couldn't be at one or the other um, to make sure that everybody that would like to participate can do so. And then we also have our TIG Facebook page that will provide some updates on information that we're receiving as well. Another thing that we wanted to bring your attention to also as we share the Padlet is just a reminder that um, we have several tools in Wisconsin that could aid in visual learning um, as well, virtual learning, sorry, as well. Um, we have the Transition, Wisconsin Transition app. So if you click on the link on the bottom here for the app, that will bring you to the page that will show you where the website is as well as how you can joined by iTunes and Google Play, as well as some tips and ideas on how you could utilize the app with families and just for students in general. The app mirrors the PTP, so it's a great way um, for students to share the information with educators as well. Um, they just need to make sure that they include your email at the end of the app, and then that will send you the results directly. And that's a great way to create the PTP as well with one another. And then we also have the self-advocacy suite. Um, the link up here gives you a video that explains each of the five things that we have within the, within the self-advocacy suite. Um, and it will explain each one in detail and what you can gain from each curriculum or guide that we have listed there. Um, there are a lot of great activities as well within the lesson plans and learning plans that you could also share with students, either printing things out or and sending it to them or doing things virtually. Um, the app also has a printable document that you can download and send to students to if they don't have access to internet. And then we have the opening door series. There's four different types of opening doors. There's opening doors to employment, to post-secondary education, um, self-determination and then also adult agencies and with in each one of those documents there's also timelines of transition activities that you could be considering while planning for um, life after high school okay and then we will open it up for questions again so Jen if you could share any questions that have come in at this time, there are not any questions specific to the presentation. Again, we are getting some excellent sharing of resources and um, saw a few reminders on here for use of um, the counties through the ADRC and DBR. Okay, great. And I did see that there is a question on opening doors. Um, you can access them online. There are still some printable copies. Um, how would they go about accessing printable copies? Um, I'm going to double check on how to access printable copies right now. Um, no DPI staff are um, working physically in the building. Um, so we do have printed copies at um, the DPI headquarters and then we have like a resource library that's at a different location. Um, there typically is a function to order printed copies of opening doors um, from that resource location. However, I don't know if that's functioning. So I need to double check on <clears throat> if that um, resource location is staff right now. But as Pam had said, all of the opening doors are available on DPI's website <clears throat> on the transition planning page. And they're also linked in the PowerPoint here as well as on TIG's website. They're considered part of the self-advocacy suite. <clears throat> right, Pam, is that where they would link them? Yes, link they can them. click right on that link, the opening doors link, 
and okay. that will bring them right to the TIG page. Yeah, so there's like lots of options of options to grab those opening doors. I did want to um, highlight, uh, I want to thank Matt Zelmer from Facets, who's on our call today. He did remind me that um, Facets is partnering with DPI on Monday, April 13th to host a webinar on facilitating effective virtual IEP meetings. So that may be of interest to our audience today, and I wanted to share that. Um, information on that webinar went out in the newsletter um, yesterday and will be archived on the special education page. So I can show that um, here when we finish our presentation, we can do a little web web search and I can um, show everyone where to find that information. <laughs> Great. And then there were some additional questions asking about finding the opening doors books online due to the fact that families are not um, some families don't have access, but then we just got a share from Susan in Madison saying that you could download from the DPR website and share that with families. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, so I will double check on the being able to access printed copies, the hard paper copies that you could share with families, and but I need to double check on if that resource is being staffed right now. <clears throat> And also, they do have printable forms to them online also, if you wanted to share those or send those to families. And then finally, Matthew just said that the webinar would also be recorded for those who would not be able to be on the Wisconsin Facets webinar. Great. Okay, so next we're going to have Brian lead us through the Padlet that we've created. Um, there's five different tabs to the Padlet, including education, employment, independent living, virtual learning supports, and then the state and national partners that we've gained information from. Thanks, Pam. So since Pam is sharing her screen, um, I'm going to have her actually go into the Padlet, and then I'm going to just briefly explain what the whole concept of us creating this Padlet is and what Padlet is and how you can access it. So on the screen, um, prior to Pam opening up the Padlet, you would have saw a link, um, a live link that will actually take you directly to the Padlet resource directory. Um, it's a URL, so it's a link that you can actually add to your desktop. Uh, you could bookmark it. And there's also a QR code on the screen. So if you have a QR code reader, um, you could go back and scan that QR code and that will bring you right to the, um, the URL. Since it's a live link, anytime um, the Transition Improvement Grant staff uh, go in and add new resources um, or update a resource, um, as long as you refresh your page, you'll always have the most current up-to-date resources um, at your fingertips. So the purpose of the, the Padlet um, which we titled Supporting Transition for Youth Using um, Online Platforms, is to provide various resources that are pertinent to educators along with strategies um, so that you continue to support your students during the COVID-19 um, mandated statewide closure for all of our school districts. Um, obviously, we know this has a, um, a drastic impact on our ability to provide supports and services for the youth that we desperate we we really care about. Um, so just a couple talking points that I want to go through really quick. Just to, first thing we want to make sure is everyone knows this is there's five tabs here. So we didn't want this to be an overwhelming um, resource. We wanted this to be something that was um, kind of keep it simple um, and things that are very pertinent to you as educators that you'll um, find useful. The Padlet is divided into sections. And as Pam explained earlier, the first section on the far left um, is education and training resources. And then the second tab is employment. The third tab, which is in the middle, is independent living, recreation and leisure. And then the fourth tab is um, supports that are directly related to supporting students through virtual learning. And then the last tab is um, state and national partnerships. And since Matt um, Zelmer is on the call, um, Wisconsin Facets is one of the um, agencies that we actually placed 
in-state and national partnership. So Pam, if you could maybe scroll down to Wisconsin fastest um, webinar calendar right there. So if Pam were to click on that resource, it would actually bring you right to Wisconsin Facets webinar calendar. And Wisconsin Facets does an excellent job providing um, weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, and even more often um, webinars uh, for educators, agencies, and other ambassadors. So I myself, and I, I know many of you as educators probably find yourselves wanting to just connect with people um, because we've kind of lost that a little bit, not being um, out and about in our job. So anytime you can do any kind of webinar learning, those are gonna be great opportunities to continue to learn and grow and, and make formal connections with others. So we included lots of different transition partners webinars in state and national partnerships. Um, and Pam is scrolling through the tab. So you can see there's lots of different resources here. There's some that we embedded in here. And Alicia, I don't know if you want to go into the, um, the DPI COVID-19 uh, page. That's at the top, Pam. So if you scroll back to the very top, we put this at the top because this is probably going to be the more likely place that you're going to click and go to because um, the Department of Public Instruction will give very accurate and timely updates to any resources. So I don't know if you want to chime in here and kind of highlight or showcase any of the things on the DPI page. Sure, I think now is a great time to do that. So um, that link that you just clicked on from the palette is that main COVID page that I was referencing um, earlier in our presentation. And Pam is looking right now at the drop down menus of you can see all the different teams who have posted COVID related information. So there is just a wealth of information on this page. Um, if Pam, could you please click the special education COVID web page, that first link there? <clears throat> So this is the special education page that I referenced that will be our main so, um, resource from the special education team um, moving forward. You can see the list of resources there, including um, the frequently asked question um, document that I spoke about earlier with the new questions added yesterday um, for, for graduation. <clears throat> um, like I said, this website will be updated regularly, um, if not multiple, times a day, the, gym, the main web page. Um, specific formal guidance from the department is planning to come out once a week. Um, wondering if there was anything else I was going to reference. I don't think so. Maybe just here's more information on DHS. Yeah, yeah. So here on our special education page, we have a link to the um, DHS COVID page. Um, it is also linked on that main page that we started on. DHS has a lot of resources out there right now. Many of them are be sharing through our media outlets as well um, about uh, regular updates. But um, <clears throat> So there is information on DHS as well around um, more specific uh, needs in terms of our youth who may be receiving like long-term services. Um, there is some information out there as well. We realize that there's a lot to sort through um, here and on everyone's website. So if you have a specific question, please don't hesitate to reach out to your TIG coordinator. We're here to help sort of make those connections and connecting with each other regular, regularly so we can kind of stay up to date and point you in the right direction. But that's the reason we created this awesome Padlet to kind of help everyone navigate this uncharted territory. <clears throat> The other thing to maybe highlight too is the NTAC calendar. Um, they have a lot of great webinars going on as well. Um, they are more nationally, national discussions versus discussions obviously that we can have here in Wisconsin, but they have a lot of great information and a lot of great resources um, as well for COVID-19. Thanks, Pam. Um, Pam, if you could go to the middle section i just want to highlight um, some of the resources around independent living recreation and leisure 
Um, I get a lot of questions um, from some of the school districts that I support in CISA two and three about kids are really struggling and are kind of at a loss with their connections to recreation and leisure activities. They find that to be some of the most valuable um, things that they do in their day-to-day -day, um, world, and that's kind of changed. So in, in this section, we have some really good resources. Um, there's a, uh, a resource um, that Pam's hovering over right now um, that we developed um, as the Transition Improvement Grant. It's a uh, developing meaningful independent living goals. And this is something that um, now more than ever in these new kind of times that we're in, um, this would be a really good resource for kids to really start working on. And we have some checklists as well that can kind of highlight some of the needs for growth in various aspects of um, living independently and navigating your community. And some of the other resources that I really like are some of the virtual tours that you can engage in. So um, right now, uh, Pam's kind of hovering over a few resources. There's one um, that she's on right now on financial management resources and budgeting. We thought that would be a really important one um, for some of the at-home learning supports that are happening. Um, Tim Markle um, pointed us in a really good direction to get some healthcare related resources. So there's a healthcare workbook for youth um, that was developed by the Wiseman Center. I really like the Decora Eagles. If anybody's ever seen the, uh, the YouTube video on the Decora Eagles, it's a pair of bald eagles that are um, in Decora, Iowa. Um, they occupy the same nest um, all the time and they um, are laying their eggs or they will be laying their eggs soon. And kids really like, um, they can chat here. They can ask questions. It's related to science. Um, it's investigative uh, and it's in the environment. So uh, my kids go there every single day and they want to check on, you know, if the male or the female bald eagle is in the nest, they want to know if the eggs have hatched. Um, so it's kind of a neat little um, resource and it's a go-to. It's no different than doing exercise or mindfulness every day. It just takes your mind off things. You can take virtual tours of the zoo. Several zoos are doing this now across the United States. Um, some of the national parks are offering virtual tours and the museums. Um, we also put some exercise and movement resources in here for mindfulness. So these would be real go-tos for folks to really kind of, as you're at home, um, things change. Uh, so we have to adapt. So these are just some creative ways to still make your formal connections to recreation and leisure. And uh, of course, the, the two go-tos on the left, the education and training resources and employment. Um, since we're virtual now, um, we have some employment related virtual tours that students can engage in. So there's some really neat uh, resources there. Um, some employment related videos. We have a photo based career quiz here, uh, some information from Career One Stop on informational interviewing. Um, that's really neat. Uh, employers can connect with students virtually and they can do informational interviews to gain access to some of the, uh, the who, what, where, when, why, and hows of, of a business. And they can gain some insight into um, their passions, preferences, and, and interests through virtual um, informational interviewing. Um, there's some virtual field trips that kids can engage in. Um, there's an Explore Work website that also allows students to virtually engage different aspects of the 16 career clusters and different pathways within those. Uh, there's some old ONET resources um, for gaining insight into different occupations and National Career Development Association resources. And we also have some resources related to DVR, um, youth in transition, um, some videos that DVR has created. So we, we didn't wanna make this too overwhelming. I can't stress that enough, that this is a, 
we can always build on this. We can add more things, but the feedback that we're getting from a lot of our educators that we support is um, everyone right now is in a little bit of a um, crisis and we're all trying to figure out um, the next moves that we're all making. So we wanted to make sure we provided you a resource, but not too overwhelming. So the, the five tabs will more, more than likely stay very consistent and we'll continue to just add more pertinent resources um, as we get them from our own research and investigation and from, from you folks that are out in the field. So it was a, this has been a really collaborative project and um, all of us from the Transition Improvement Grant have uh, been really vested in trying to come up with the best way to share resources with all of you. So we sure do appreciate all of you. Thank you, Brian. Um, and I just wanted to take you, I know there's a few questions about our COVID information on our website. So if you can see here, our featured information area, this is where we have our PowerPoint. We'll put the recording of this webinar here. And then here's where the Padlet is that Brian was just referring to. And then a couple of other questions specific to the Padlet. Um, is there any information on how to embed these individual tabs into a Google Classroom that a district may be using? And then is there any information about social emotional learning or mental health? Brian, do you want to start with the um, first question? Um, I know enough about Google Classroom to be um, slightly informed. And since Padlet is a live link, um, probably the best way to embed it would be to uh, create a, um, a picture using a text box and maybe a, um, some kind of a graphic or some words that describe that Padlet and then embed the live link into that, um, that photo. And then uh, students will be able to, cl to click on that and be able to get to the Padlet. That's probably the best advice that I could think of, unless anybody else from uh, our grant has any other ideas about that. Just pause for a second and get everyone a second to think. <clears throat> Um, okay, I, I'd love to address the social emotional um, learning question. I think the self advocacy suite um, that TIG has includes many applicable um, lessons that will not only build self advocacy skills, but social emotional skills as well. Um, Pam, would you mind if I shared my screen for a second? Oh, sure. Thanks. I did also want to highlight for everyone um, that the I am currently on the main COVID page for DPI. And if you scroll down, the tab for pupil services um, includes a link to our um, student, um, student services prevention and wellness team or SSPW, you might hear us call it. Um, they have, for anyone who's unfamiliar, a wealth of resources many of them already online um, in, in regards to building social emotional skills and supporting mental health needs. Um, so this is SSPW's main page. You can see their first tab is online training resources that include um, building social emotional skills and their trauma-informed care. Um, there is a community of practice around mental health in this drop down, as well as resources from our school nurses, our school counseling, school psychology. So I do encourage you um, to, to um, explore um, SSPW's resources around so social emotional learning and um, also uh, think about the connections to, to those skills in our, our self-advocacy suite. Thank you, Alicia. If you wanna, there you go. I was gonna say you could go ahead and share again. Well, as we wrap up today, we just wanna make sure that everyone knows that we are here for any questions, any comments, any concerns that you have. We will 
do the best that we absolutely can to answer any of those questions or to find the answers for you. So just remember too that um, you can post those questions on our Google community, um, share those questions and resources with us during networking times, and then just um, review our Facebook posts um, that we'll occasionally have up as well. Jen, is there any other specific questions that have been posed that we'd like to answer now with the last few minutes? Fine. Um, one overarching question was, was there any guidance relating to online platforms to use with students through the department? As Zoom is not, I'm hearing on some of the chats that Zoom is not um, secure enough to use with students. So there is um, reference to not a specific platform, but the confidentiality um, concerns in regards to providing special education services on a virtual platform. That is one of the questions in the FAQ. Um, Pam, I'm going to ask to screen share again. <clears throat> Sorry about that. No I think it's worth um, showing to everyone. So let me make sure. So um, this is still our SSPW. So here is the special education web page. And I am going to click on the frequently at oh, that's finance. Sorry, frequently asked questions document. Um, so this is the document that I've been referencing that's going to be updated once a week um, by our compliance team. And one of the new questions added yesterday was in regards to um, confidentiality um, and and uh, providing service over virtual platforms. There, there is nothing in our state and federal laws that prohibit providing service over virtual platforms. What the department encourages is that um, schools and educators be very open with parents about how those services are, are going to be provided. Um, they may consider getting specific consent for providing service over those platforms. Um, and that the Department of Ed did release um, a statement stating that essentially there is no system that is ultimately secure. And so we just have to do our very best um, to make sure that we keep those lines of communication open and take the steps that we do need to protect student confidential information. I know there's been a lot of, um, anecdotally, there's a lot of resources out there from um, platforms like Zoom on how to um, make those connections more secure by requiring passwords um, or, um, using waiting rooms to admit people. So if you're not recognizing somebody, you don't have to let them in. Um, I know we do have a Zoom tutorial on the Padlet, but those resources are out there from some of those popular forums. And I think a lot of schools talked in the chat about using Google. Um, being Google schools and those connections may be more secure because they're um, directly linked to your school networks. Are there any other questions, Jen? At this time, there are not any other questions. So what we'll do with the chat information is we'll pull any questions um, and provide answers to those that maybe we didn't get to. And then also any of the resources that you guys have shared, we'll also pull together that we can share out on the featured information on our website as well. So we we'll, should be able to do that sometime next week. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today. We appreciate your time. We know this is information that you want and need. And again, um, just remember the networking opportunities that we have available as well. Um, like I said, the Google community will check on a regular basis as well as our networking meetings next week. So we'll stay on for a few more minutes if there's any other questions that anyone has. Um, for anyone that um, does not have any other questions, um, thank you again for joining us. And I will mention, Pam, if you hadn't mentioned it already, that um, you may be receiving a follow-up email that would include some of those polls, poll questions that we were unable to, to utilize today. Um, and an evaluation as well. So if you could complete that for us, that would definitely help us support our future networking and resources for the field. Pam and Alicia, we received the question, will the meetings next week be the same as today? 
No. So our meetings next week will look different. They will be more of a networking opportunity for you to connect with one another versus um, providing information. However, the two networking dates will be pretty much the same. So we can anticipate those meetings to be much more interactive between the audience um, with TIG facilitating um, with some discussion questions as well. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you.